All right. Hi, everybody. Hey. Welcome to this toasty, toasty little room. Uh, I'm Chelsea Steiner. I am a sex educator. Uh, I worked as a sex, sex educator for about two and a half years at the Pleasure Chest in West Hollywood. Um, oh, you've heard of it. Um, and, <laughs> and I love teaching sex ed, uh, especially queer sex ed is my passion. So we're going to talk about sex ed today for queer bodies, for all types of bodies. Um, and yeah, and what else can I tell you? Oh, um, I'm the, also the weekend editor at the Mary Sue, because we all contain multitudes. And this is my co-host, Melissa Price. Dr. Hi. Melissa Price. I'm Dr. Melissa Price. I am here to fill in some of the um, technical gaps, as it were. I am also a published lesbian fiction writer. Um, my category is lesbianage, so I... <laughs> You know, it's like it's romance and intrigue, or as I sometimes think of it, uh, spies, lies, and quivering thighs. <laughs> and um, on top of that, not literally, I also, um, this happens to be the actual day of the release of my new release, Smile Number no. 7, so I'm wearing, thank you, thank you. And this one's pretty much just romance, it's all lesbian romance. So as you can imagine, as a lesbian romance writer, I have to write a lot of sex scenes. And that's what brings me here today. <laughs> so forgive, forgive my sweatiness, I did run here from the other panel. I'm also pregnant, so I'm constantly sweating out of breath. Um, but yeah, so let's get started. So the first thing I like to do is kind of define clitoracy. Now, you don't have to be clitorate to be clitorate, you don't have to own a clit. You don't have to, you know, you, it applies to all body parts, all types, all genders. But to me, clitoracy is literally just being sexually knowledgeable and being open and sex positive and containing a non judgmental, compassionate attitude towards yourself and towards your partners. So. Uh, today we're going to talk about these subjects. We're going to talk about communication. We're going to talk about safe sex for queer couples. Yes, it does exist. Can everyone hear me? Is this picking up on the mic? Yeah. Okay. Good. Let me know. If, let me know if I'm getting away from it. Or if you can't hear me, um, we're going to talk about anatomy, and we're going to talk about some of our favorite tips, tricks, and toys, and then we'll have a Q and A. So let's talk. I'm sorry. Is this? Can I turn this one on? Because I feel weird, like, meh. Um, we can hear you if you yeah, don't can, be Can meh. you guys hear me if I just talk? Is this OK? OK. So as a sex educator, I encounter people with a lot of problems, a lot of issues with themselves in a couple with their partners. I can't achieve orgasm. I don't know how to make my partner come. I'm embarrassed to ask for x, y, or z in bed. And 95 of these sexual issues or problems can be resolved with communication. And communication is huge. Because most of us have grown up in America, we've grown up with little to no sex education and absolutely no queer sex education. So we come at this from a lacking place. And we've also been grown up, depending on your family, your religious background, your cultural background, to be ashamed of our sexuality especially for women. There's a lot of shame surrounding it. There's shame surrounding masturbation. There's shame surrounding queer identities, gender identities. So all of this together makes us not want to talk about sex. And we should, because talking about sex is great. Like I like to say, if you're doing it, you should be able to talk about it. And if you're not doing it yet, talking about it is a great way to get there. So number one, consent is key. Consent is sexy, and consent isn't just badgering someone into sex. It's an enthusiastic yes. I'm excited. I want to be here. I want to do X, Y, and Z with you. If it's not an enthusiastic fuck yeah, it's a no. So always be respectful. Always keep open communication. And a lot of people are like, yeah, but doesn't that ruin the mood? Or do I have to ask permission every time I touch you here, touch you there? It doesn't ruin the mood. It's sexy. It makes your partner feel safe. It makes them feel respected. And it's important to have these conversations. Um, Can I add something to absolutely, that? Absolutely, yeah. I think sometimes when people are in that moment and there is intimacy and there is connection, um, even then, I think people have a really difficult time, some people, 
uh, saying what feels good or what doesn't feel good. And so it's okay, and it doesn't ruin the moment to stop and say, how's it, how's it going for you? How you, how you feeling right now? Um, some people need to be asked. Yeah, I do think it's also important with what I call show and tell your partner. Um, and by this I mean talking about what's working for you or what isn't. A common thing is if you're in a sexual encounter with someone and they're like, do you like this? Do you like what I'm doing to you now? And you don't want to be like, no, or like it's not really doing it for me. <laughs> Instead of being like, do you like this thing? Just be like, how does this feel to you? Is this something that you're enjoying? Do you want me to go faster or slower? Do you want me to use more pressure or less pressure? The more specif specificity in your questions and in your sexual communication, the better your answers are gonna be and the better your results are gonna be. Another big part of this is body language and reading the body language of your partner. If they're making noise, if they're moving parts of their body closer to you, if they're breathing heavily, these are all good signs that what you're doing is working. If they aren't making any noise, if their breathing is very level, if it's very quiet, or if they're like scooting away from you in the bed, that's, that's talking. They're telling you something. They're saying, this isn't working for me, or I'm not into this. So it's important to really read each other and communicate with each other. Now this is an area, in terms of sexual satisfaction, um, in terms of orgasm after sex, queer women have the highest rate of sexual satisfaction. Because, yes, round of applause, round of applause. Because we know how to communicate. We're always processing, we're always talking about our feelings, and that includes our feelings in bed. Um, another thing to keep in mind is when you're talking about, you know, if your partner's doing something that you're not into, don't be like, I hate that. Get your tongue out of my ear. Um, so be, remember to always lead, because sex, it's so vulnerable, right? We're naked, we're exposed, it's so intimate. Our hearts are on the line. So remember to always approach creative criticism with compassion, with love, with respect. Instead of being like, I hate it when you touch me like that, be like, I would prefer if you touch me in this way. I'm also a big fan of the compliment sandwich, uh, which comes from the corporate world, where you say something nice, a criticism, a critique, and then something nice. So something like, hey girl, I really liked it when we were kissing on the couch. I really didn't like it when you snapped my bra strap, but then you kissed my neck and I was really into that. Bum, 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 bum. Compliment sandwich. Um, another great tool is the yes, no, maybe list. And this is a list, this is one from Pleasure Chest, but if you just Google yes, no, maybe list, You'll, it'll come up on Google in a bunch of different formats. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a list of different, <laughs> it's a list of, and you see there's a tamer side on that side and then the kinkier side, but it's just a list. And you, what's fun to do is you print out two of these, you sit down with your partner, you each fill out your lists, there's no wrong answers, and then you compare notes. So you might find out something new and interesting like, oh, I had no idea that you were into exhibitionism, or I had no idea that Fisting is a hard no for you. Good to know. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Um, and of course, within this, there's lots of room for conversation. Maybe you like to be the one spanking, but you hate to be spanked. Or maybe it's the reverse. Maybe you're interested in exploring something, or something else is a hard limit. The important thing is, again, get it all out on the table. Talk about it. You both may be really interested in a certain act or in a certain performance that maybe it had never come up before. And now you have this new shared kink to explore. How fun for you. Um, so I think that it's just a really great tool to just start talking about stuff and to start talking about what you're into. Always respect, if something is on your no list or something's a hard limit, it's a no. Don't push, don't wheedle, don't plead, don't guilt. It's a no. So always respect your partner's boundaries. And again, you might, something might be a no at one point in time, and then maybe a few years later something changes, and you're like, you know what? I'm gonna shift this into the maybe con uh, column. The yes, no, maybe list is not a binding contract. It's not a legal contract. You are free to change your mind at any point in the yes, no, maybe list in your lives. All right, so let's talk about safe queer sex. So for a lot of people, it's like, well, if I'm a woman having sex with another woman, um, and we both have vulvas, 
we're not gonna get pregnant, so we don't need safety, ha ha. <laughs> Guess what? You need safety. Um, some of the best tools for safe sex are dental dams, which are literally just a rectangular sheet of latex that acts as a barrier. So you can put that barrier over a vulva, over a butthole, and go to town, but you have that protective barrier. Now, some advice. Put some lube in between the person's skin and the barrier. It'll make things a lot, it'll feel a lot better. No one likes the feeling of dry latex on their clit. It's not, I mean, maybe someone does. Maybe you do you. But, it's, <laughs> but most of the time, it's not gonna be the most satisfying sensation. Another tip, whenever I'm using a dental dam, I always take a magic marker or Sharpie, and at the bottom, I write hi in the bottom corner. Why? Because you're rolling around, things are getting dirty, and if the dental dam comes off, you have to remember which side you are using on the person. So if you put it back on and it says, eh, instead of hi, <laughs> you've defeated the purpose of the dental dam. Another thing to keep in mind, um, lube. Guys, lube is great. It's the ketchup on the french fry of your sex life. I know there's a lot of women out there, there's a lot of lube shaming, like, I get plenty wet on my own. I don't need lube, fuck you. And it's like, relax, lube is, lube is great. Some of us have issues with vaginal dryness, or sometimes it just makes what's already there wet better, and it makes it more slipperier and more sensitive and more tactile. It also cuts down on friction, so you don't end up with, you know, bruises or irritated spots. There's so many different types of lube available. I always recommend a water-based lube with no glycerin, because that'll be the most adaptable for all bodies. It won't irritate you. My favorite brand is Sutil, which I passed out. Um, I think it's really luxurious, really nice. I also like Sliquid. Sliquid's a brand that has a variety of non-glycerin, water-based lubes. So with water-based lubes, they tend to dry out quicker than a silicone-based lube or an oil-based lube. But because it's water, you add a little bit of water, you add a little bit of spit, and it's reactivated again. So it keeps going. <clears throat> um, I also would advise you, a lot of people are very into oil. Right now, coconut oil is like, Every, put it on your hair, put it in your salad, put it in your pussy, like put it everywhere. <laughs> I would say, I love coconut oil, I get it, it smells great, it makes your pussy smell like a pina colada, who doesn't like that? Um, but I will say that oil and vaginas are not always a great mix because it takes longer for your body to expel oil-based lube. And with water-based lube, because it's water-based, the water absorbs into your skin and absorbs into your body, so it shouldn't irritate you. With oil-based, it might take longer to clean out and to come out. That means it could trap bacteria, it could trap nastiness in your parts, and nobody likes that. Um, I will say, coconut oil does have antifungal and antimicrobial properties. I still wouldn't use oil if you're having any sort of vaginal penetration. That's just me. I think it's really great for butt stuff because um, that's it's less of a balanced ecosystem than a vagina is, but you do you. Another thing about coconut oil or any type of oil-based lube, oil destroys latex. So if you're trying to have safe sex with an oil-based lube, you need to use protection that isn't latex-based. Which brings me to another great protective barrier, gloves. So gloves, you can get latex gloves. You can also get nitrile gloves, which are really great if you have a latex allergy or if you want to play around with oils but you still want the barrier. Um, gloves are great because um, they're sexy, especially if you get black gloves. Um, or if you get the blue gloves, if you're into some doctor nurse role play, you do that. <laughs> That's its own kink. Um, but, or not. Or not. Or what, you know, you do you. Um, but nitrile gloves are great, and you can get them in a big box. It'll last you forever. It's like 200 gloves in a box. And it's just a great protective barrier. It's great if you have hangnails, if you have a manicure you don't want to mess up. And if you're, if you're one of those brave, bold, <clears throat> queer women with serious nails or nail art, put a cotton ball in the fingertip of that glove. <sighs> <sighs> And, and put and just and just pop that glove on glove on over it. I also know that some people like to put a band-aid over a nail and that's also protective. I like cotton balls. It's really up to you. Um, another fun thing you can do with a glove is if you cut off the fingers of a glove 
and cut up the side, you open it up, you have your own dental dam with room for your tongue where the thumb is. So that's another DIY if you're like, I only have gloves but no dental dam and I want to eat pussy but I can't. You can use that. Um, that's a great hack. I know, it's, it's, it's a fun hack. Guys, sex hacks, they're great. Um, also, keeping your toys safe. Um, toy materials. Now, I'm not going to go in a huge toy material spiel because honestly, we don't have the time. Um, but there are certain materials that sex toys are made out of. They're either porous or they're non porous. And you're going to want to use a non porous toy because it won't absorb bacteria or infections or any nastiness. In a non porous toy, you can clean and sterilize. Non porous materials, the most popular one is silicone. Everything we have on the table today is a silicone toy. Silicone's great because it can come in a different variety of densities. It can be like hard and firm, it can be squishy, it can be dual density. Um, you kind of can't go wrong with silicone toys. Other um, non porous toys, stainless steel certain medical grade plastics, glass. Guys, I know glass sounds scary, but invest in some glass, it'll blow your mind. Um, if you're using a porous toy, which are great, they're made of you know, cyber skin, silica skin, other kind of cheaper materials, those might leave, you know, it's not great chemistry for your body, but they're cheaper and we're all on a budget. So if you're gonna use a non-porous toy, throw a condom on it. Keep it safe. Keep your toys easy to clean. OK, so let's talk about anatomy for a little bit. How you, Dr. Melissa, how you doing? You good? I'm learning an awful lot today. <laughs> I'm blazing, I know I'm blazing through. Um, but, but we're going to get to some physiology stuff right totally. now, because we're getting into anatomy. How's everybody doing? Is the pace good? We good? Yeah. Yes? All right, am I sweating profusely, a little bit profusely? No. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is an anatomy chart that comes from a really terrific resource called Trans Bodies, Trans Selves. If you're a trans person or you love a trans person or you're friends with a trans person, this is a really great resource to read. And you can find it on Amazon or bookstores, Trans Bodies, Trans Selves. But what I love about this chart is you have the interposed, you know, you have penis anatomy and you have vaginal anatomy. And the reason why I like this graphic so much is because at the end of the day, all of our genitals are made from the same stuff. When we become embryos, when we begin existing, we're these little like bundle of cells with an anus. And that's it. We're just these tiny little buttholes floating around. <laughs> Some of us grow out of the asshole phase. Some of us remain assholes for the rest of our lives. Well, <laughs> But what's so interesting is as our fetuses, as these fetuses grow, as we develop in utero, we're all made of the same tissue material, of the same blood vessels, of the same musculature. It's just in different shapes and formats. The erectile tissue that makes up a penis is the same type of tissue that makes up the clitoris and the internal clitoris. It's, it's the same shit. We're all built out of the same pieces. They're just in different configurations. How cool is that? Um, so I'm going to move on. I'm going to go into, so for a lot of people, so let's talk about some analogous parts. The clitoris, which if you're a person with a vulva, is the most sensitive, most nerve dense part of the body. The clitoris has something like over 8,000 nerve endings. Um, is going to be like the most concentrated source of nerve pleasure. If you're in a body with a penis, that's going to be the head and the underside of the head of the penis, um, sometimes called the corona. So that's basically analogous to the same tissue and musculature that a clitoris has. Um, similarly, the G spot, which is inside the vagina and towards the front wall, same tissue, same makeup as the prostate or the P-spot, except that's found up the butt towards the front of the body. It's all the same junk. The thi can I add to that? Yes, please. Just to clarify a little bit, um, not only is erectile tissue exactly the same in the clitoris as it is in a penis, it, the, when, you, when Chelsea's talking about the different arrangement of the anatomical parts, I think a lot of women don't realize that an, a large part of the clitoris itself is internal. So it's not just what you can touch, it's actually inside the body. 
So let's talk a little bit about the internal clitoris. The clitoris as we know it, that little button right on the outside of the vagina, is literally the tip of the clitoral iceberg. Did you guys know that your clitoris has legs? It has legs. And they were made for walking. No, they weren't. <laughs> but, but the actual structure of the clitoris is this whole organ inside, underneath our skin in our bodies. And the clitoris, as you can see, the glans clitoris, that's the exposed part. But it has a whole body underneath. It has two vestibular bulbs, and it also has two crura, or legs, running along either side of it. Um, and what's cool, and here's kind of like the 3D through the body shot of it, the yellow portion's the clit, and the blue part is the vagina, uterus, floating ovaries. So what's cool is we've been raised kind of with this, well not raised, but we're, we learn this kind of sexual binary when it comes to female sexuality that there's vaginal G-spot orgasms, there's clitoral orgasms, and they're two separate things. And that's just not true. Because as you can see, the clitoral muscle and the structure of the clit is wrapped all around the vaginal canal. So it's all interconnected, and it's all kind of part of the same stuff. Because of this internal clitoris, if you find that you enjoy, maybe not for a lot of us, direct clitoral stimulation is too intense, right? But if you really enjoy stimulation around the labia, down the sides, that's your internal clit. That's your clitoral legs. So that's what's getting aroused when this whole area is being massaged or touched or kissed. That's all the internal clitoris. Now, you might be wondering, what the fuck? Why did nobody tell me about the internal clitoris in health class? Why did no one talk about this? They didn't discover that the internal clitoris existed until 2009. 2009. The clit is, le is like a decade old. Internal clit's a decade old. Now, why? Why did it take them so long? Well, most doctors and researchers are cis straight men, and they don't give a shit about female pleasure or female anatomy. Which is like, eh, you know, again, blame it on the patriarchy. They're the source of all that's wrong. Um, so what this means is you don't have to, you know, a lot of women, for like about 70% of women, clitoral orgasm is the main way that they orgasm. And Did you maybe, say 70? Yeah, like something around 60 to 70 is clitoral. That's funny because in Guyton's medical physiology, I think they stated at 80. 80? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I was looking up, so some, and again, it varies depending on who you ask, but roughly like two thirds of women mainly come through clitoral or external stimulation, um, with like 30 to 40 percent coming via vaginal stimulation. But because now that we know that it's a lot, the situation's a lot more nuanced than that. Um, there's more going on. So I feel like as we move forward in, you know, sexuality for people with vulvas, this is going to be, be a thing of like, it's all connected. There's no right or wrong way to have an orgasm, you know? As long as you're having fun and you're getting off, good for you. You're doing it. You're great. <laughs> okay, internal clip. Um, do you want to talk about the physiology of orgasms? Yeah, actually, this would probably be a good time to go into... Um, I have it kind of divided between the psychic factors and the physiologic factors um, for sex. But before I even go there, I'm just curious. Shout it out. How long do you think the female orgasm lasts? 28 seconds. You've timed it? <laughs> Wait, we have 48, what did you say? I will say it can last for a very long time, depending upon what you're doing. Longer than 48 seconds? Um, yeah. like 20 minutes if you do certain things. Oh, that's time trick. That's a different. What, what are you doing later? <laughs> Actually, the consensus at the moment is 20 seconds. But you got to figure, you know, that they're polling a lot of straight women. Uh, I'm not going to comment on that, but um, that, that's where the medical aspect comes in at the moment. And, you know, neuroscientists, forget medical, because, like you said, it's very cis, mm -hmm. patriarchal. But where I like to read is science. And 
neuroscientists will admit that there's a lot they really still don't understand about female sexuality. Um, but there's something that happens because of neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are chemicals that take that stimulation and it causes nerve excitation to relay that message all the way from that organ up to the brain. What's really interesting is that during orgasm, the brain is flooded with dopamine. It's sitting there going, and, and it's also the chemical that happens in addiction. So that's the chemical that says, oh man, this is great, let's do it again, all right? Um, by the time you orgasm, there are roughly 30 brain systems involved, 30, 30. Think about that for just a little second. But that's during pleasurable sex. So, you know, when you think about sex drive, it, it's very psychic. And the psychic and the physiologic come together. Personally, I believe that's where the, the best orgasms happen. Um, but to your point, when you're talking about the erectile tissue in penile Americans and vulval <laughs> Americans, um, or people, humans, the, the crazy thing is it really is the same. And, and we're led to believe that, no, it's not. What's odd in the psychic aspect for women is that societally, we're mostly shut down about sex from day one. So even if someone is physiologically healthy and they really do love someone or they really do want to connect with someone physically, that psychic aspect can be so strong that they cannot achieve that, that goal. Um, when <laughs> that dopamine is going to flood your brain. It's going to flood it. And when that happens, you lose inhibition. Your pain tolerance increases. Um, I'm trying to think if, you know, if, if you think about it, anybody who has had a low back injury, back pain, um, problems in the lower body, those nerves in the low back and in the sacral area, which is you know, just below, those nerves have to transmit those impulses, that excitation, up to the brain. If somebody has an injury or if they hurt, that not only affects the physiologic ability of the impulse to go to the brain to create that moment, it also creates a psychic stress of, uh-oh, you know, like I can't get there. How's my partner going to feel about that? You know, do I fake it? No. Well, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of women who, who actually uh, go through that. So there are a few low back exercises for people who have those problems. And, um, you know, if you, you want to Google those, I think you could probably Google the Williams low back exercises, and or you could talk to a physical therapist, anybody who can help you with that. Um, when you're looking at, there was something else that you had mentioned with regard to. Was it this one? I don't know. I want to say that, going back to pain tolerance for a second, mm -hmm. the actual percentage that your body may be able to tolerate during orgasm that it cannot at another time, 50%. Now imagine somebody punches you in the arm and it hurts. During orgasm, they could punch you twice as hard and you wouldn't even feel it. So be a little careful if you really like to go for it, you, you know, that you don't do any injury to your body because you really may not be feeling it. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about most importantly, is stress hormones. People are under a lot of stress everywhere. And when we are, it releases a hormone called cortisol. And that comes out of your adrenal glands. You've heard of adrenaline, get up and go, you know. 
Well, when people keep getting up and going too much, that system gets exhausted. What's important about it is that the adrenal system is part of your endocrine hormonal system. It can affect your estrogen, your progesterone, your cycle. All of that will play into sex drive, fatigue, and fatigue is really important. So, you know, honor yourself. Learn to honor yourself with your sexuality. It's okay. It's okay to be in the middle of something and say, this is great, babe. I want to just like chill for a little while and then we can get back to it. It's okay. Yeah, and that also goes back to listening to your body and paying attention and being in tune with your own body, uh, which is why I think I'm a big supporter of the best way to find out what you like, what you don't like in bed is masturbation and self-exploration. Because if you don't know what gets you off, how can you communicate that to your partner? That's also a lot of pressure to put on someone else. Yeah. Yeah, make and me come. How do you like to come? I don't know. <laughs> Figure it out. Well, you know, there's a great word. I think it, it, it's a great word to use. Let's explore. And that takes all the pressure off of both parties. It's like, let's explore, you know, this feels good. Let's do that now. How's that feel? Well, I don't know. I do think, and a lot of times, you know, when we're children, we play. Play is really important. And then when you grow up and you're an adult, you don't really play anymore. And I think that the arena of sex is a great place to play. Uh, one of my favorite uh, sex educators, a kinky sex educator named Midori, likes to call kinky sex cops and robbers with fucking, <laughs> and that's what it should be. Sex should be fun. It can be intense, it can be emotional, it can be an act of love, but at the end of the day, you should be able to giggle about it and laugh when someone makes a funny noise or a funny face. Don't put so much pressure on yourself to be like, this has to be the most important sex of all time. Mm -hmm. You're having fun. Well, know? it also plays into intimacy. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people confuse sex with intimacy. And that's something that I, I think each person really needs to think about and experience. You know, when you're with someone and you're having a great time, or you love someone and you're just not really into it, there is an intimacy that supersedes the sexuality. And it does make the sexuality better because intimacy by its nature brings you closer to someone. That in itself changes your brain chemistry, it changes your physiologic chemistry, and you may have a much better time than you thought you were gonna have. Yeah, I agree. So I'm going to pivot now. I want to talk a little bit about sex toys that I really like, uh, one of my favorite topics. Um, so when you go, if you're online shopping for sex toys, or if you go to a, your local sex positive sex toy store, it's easy to get overwhelmed. There's so many different products. And you're just like, oh my god, like what is this stuff? How to do, what do I want? What do I even like? So here are some of my suggestions, my top picks um, for external stimulation. That external means clitoral, anything on the outside that's not penetrative. If you're a person with a penis, this means penile stimulation. Um, so here's some stuff that I love. First of all, the Fun Factory Volta. And here's the thing. I am frequently, sometimes I'll look at a toy and I'll be like, the fuck is that? And when I saw this, I was like, I'm like, and I'm such a judgmental bitch too. I'm like, that toy's bullshit. And then, I, and then I used it and I was like, oh, I'm an asshole. This toy is amazing. So what's so cool about the Volta, in Fun Factories, it's a great company. It's German. Um, they recycle. They use like uh, high quality silicone. If you're in the market for sex toys, normally, look, I'm American, I support buying American, but the codes and the stringencies on sex toy production in Europe are much higher. In America, they're novelties, so Americans can get away with maybe less safe toys, maybe less exciting toys. Of course, there are incredible American brands like Tantus or like New York Toy Collective that I'm gonna talk about, but European toys face a stricter set of standards. So something to keep in mind. So what's cool about the Volta is it's made out of uh, silicone. It's rechargeable, so it's good for the environment. Um, and what happens is these two little duck lips kind of flutter when you turn it on. So it's almost like, uh, like kind of a rabbit ear sensation around the clit. These also spread out. They're great for kind of encompassing the vulva. They're great for kind of encompassing or using up and down a penis. It's a really fun, now this is not a toy I would use internally. 
I mean, you can try it, see if you like it, um, but it's designed for external kind of enveloping the clitoris sensation. So that's pretty cool, and it has, it's a high quality toy. So it comes with bells and whistles like travel locks, multiple speeds and settings, waterproof, body safe silicone, stuff like that. So this was a toy that came out where I was like shocked at how good it was. Now another toy I like is the Womanizer. Now, terrible title. They're, it's, I believe it's like it's a European company and I don't think they understand the implications of the term. But, and that was another one where I was like, Womanizer, fuck you. But joke's on me, these toys are <laughs> amazing. I'm wrong about a lot of things. Um, so basically, and this is that, the Womanizer kind of kicked off a new trend in sex toy tech called pulse air technology. So basically what happens is it's a little nozzle that you put right over the clit and it basically creates kind of like a suctiony vacuuming sensation. What it's doing is it's delivering concentrated puffs of air on the clit. What it feels like is oral sex. It feels like someone's sucking on your clit, which is dope. Um, um, so this pardon me. So this is the first toy of its kind. It inspired a bunch of knockoffs, like the Satisfier, which is also cool, and like the Lilo Sona. Um, but basically, it's concentrated direct stimulation on the clit. You know what that is, actually. It's what, um, what you're, you're doing with that physiologically is you're bringing blood to the area, mm -hmm. and you're engorging it. And that's, that's what's going to bring the orgasm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a really, it's a very, it's a new sex tech. It's very cool. I'm a big fan of it. Another thing that's great is maybe if you're new to the world of sex toys and you're like, I want to start with something simple and not overwhelming, is a classic bullet vibe. Um, these can come in like a very cheap, kind of buzzy, like $10 vibe. Or if you spend a little bit more, you can get something nice like the Femme Fun Bullet. This bullet is about like this long. It's silicone, it's body safe. It's got a deep rumbly vibration as opposed to kind of a higher frequency buzzing vibration. And FemFun Bullet retails about like $45, I think. Um, but if you have the money to invest in like a nicer quality silicone bullet, I'd say go for it. It's waterproof, it's got multi-speeds, yes. Nice, seven different vibrations. So in terms of, with sex toys, like with all things, you get what you pay for. Um, so I think it's worth it to invest a little bit more money to something that's higher quality, that'll last longer, that's rechargeable. Um, those are gonna be your kind of higher quality, as opposed to your like 10, 15, $20 battery operated buzz machines. But again, some people love those, so you do you. Can I do a shameless plug? Yes. Okay. Always. Um, the cards that I had handed out earlier, just wanted to let you know if you're interested in any of my terrific books with great sex scenes, um, there is a discount if you order them through Bella Books during the con, and they're in the exhibit hall. Bella Books, support them. Um, so totally. now I want to talk a bit about internal toys and strap-on sex. So you have a lot of options when it comes to strapping it on. Um, my favorite brand of harnesses is made by a company called Spare Parts. They're American made. They're a queer woman owned and run company and we always want to support those. And yep. this type of strap on, it's very, f I'm, I like to be Femi in bed. So I like a Femi strap on. Uh, this is called the Sasha. It ha comes with little like garter clips. It has ruches on the side. So it looks like a sexy pair of underwear. Um, Spare Parts also makes ones that are more bikini style. They make boxer brief more mask style, if that's more your stees. Um, and they're just a really high quality harness company. A good harness, like Spare Parts harnesses, are a bit more expensive, but they last. I've been using my Sasha for like six, seven years. Can you and talk it about control? Yeah, so and what, what I like about, and if you're gonna go with a brief style harness as opposed to a literally strap on harness, is the fit. You wanna go and try it on somewhere and make sure that it fits snug, cause that's gonna give you more control over the dildo. Because if you have, there's some brands where it's like a little bit more loosey goosey, and if you don't have control, you're not gonna, it's not gonna perform the way that you want it to perform. Um, so I would recommend, if you just Google like spare parts harnesses, it'll come up and all different designs and it's just quality work. It's well made, it's machine washable. 
um, and it'll last. So a harness is the kind of thing where I'm like, if I have like my sex toy budget, if I'm looking to like, what do I want to spend more money on? A good harness will really last you forever. If you treat it well, and if you take good care of it, it should last you a lifetime. Um, now, talking about dildos. There's a million different kinds in different shapes, colors, designs. If you want something that's very, very um, human anatomy accurate, that's an option. If you want something that's more whimsical or less penisy, that's an option too. Everyone has their own particular tastes. A company I really love is called New York Toy Collective. It's a queer owned and operated company out of Brooklyn. Um, and they make really fantastic dildos. They also make gender affirming products like Packers, STPs, high quality silicone, really quality stuff. Um, the Shiloh is kind of their first basic dildo. It comes in flesh tones. I like a rainbow dick. I want a dick that looks like it went to Coachella and like had a great time. Um, <laughs> what's so cool about the Shiloh is it's one of the only legitimate pack and play dildos. So it basically has a wire inside of it, which means you can bend it and it'll hold its shape. So if you want to go out, if you want to pack, you can wear your harness, tuck the Shiloh down and walk around in your packing. And then when it's time to party, you can lift it back up and you can fuck with it. And it's one of the few dildos that is actually, you can pack with it and you can play with it, which is really exciting. It's also made, New York Toy Collective uses something called dual density silicone, which means it's like squishy on the outside, but firm on the inside, gives it a really great sensation, really nice. Um, and just like the, the flexibility of it is really fun. Um, again, with dildos, I would recommend silicone ones because non-porous, safer, you're also going to have flexibility with the silicone ones. Um, but they again, don't break as easily. and they don't break. Honestly, if you take care of silicone, like you should have no problems that dildo will last you a lifetime. Caveat, we don't mix silicone toys with silicone lube. Um, because it kind of like attracts like and it'll kind of destroy the toy. I also wouldn't use oil-based lube with silicone because it's harder to clean off. If you're like, I gotta use that oil, I gotta use that silicone lube, throw a condom on your dildo. Problem solved. But what's great about silicone is you can sterilize it. Once you're done with it, you can use antibacterial toy cleaner, you can boil it, you can put it in the top rack of the dishwasher, make sure you empty your dishwasher before your parents come over. That's a tip from me to you. Um, but it really That's will, so true. If it doesn't have like a motor in it, if it doesn't have a motor in it, you can do any of those things and you will have a sterilized toy, which is great. Um, finally, uh, double dildos. Double ended dildos are tricky because you're looking, it's hard enough to find a toy that satisfies you because we're all different, we're all different unique sexual snowflakes. So what might work for one person might do nothing for someone else. A double ended dildo has to please two different people. So that's asking a lot out of a toy. Um, for a lot of people, it's the idea that like, oh, a double-ended dildo is like a harness-free toy and I can use it without a harness. Unless you're Wonder Woman and you have vaginal muscles of steel, you're gonna wanna wear a harness. Or if you're, lying, if you're the one wearing the dildo and you're lying on your back and kind of can create that stability. But if you're using a double-ended dildo, you'll get way more control and way more comfort if you're wearing a harness. Um, there's a bunch of different kinds to choose from. I brought my favorite, which is a Wet For Her double-ended dildo. It's called The Union. Wet For Her is another queer-owned and operated company. There's a theme here. And what's really cool about the Wet For Her dildo is a lot of double-ended dildos have a very wide internal end. So the person who's wearing it, some of those bulbs are just too big. Now again, we all have differently sized parts, but for a lot of them, I was, it's just too big to wear and it's uncomfortable to wear. Union has a nice, slim, comfortable fitting internal portion. It also has this ridged kind of portion, which is great for clitoral stimulation. And the other end, the insertable portion on the other side is bendable. So you can bend it a little bit and it comes with a little vibe motor in the base. So it's got a lot of nice bells and whistles. It's my favorite double-ended dildo, and I've tried a bunch, believe me, and I hate most of them, but this one's pretty dope. Um, successories. Lube, like I said, lube everywhere, lube all the time, lube for days. Um, another fun thing is a massage candle. If you're like, I wanna try sex toys, but like, I'm novice, I'm very, like, I'm conservative, I'm not, 
like I'm not ready to go out and buy a bondage gear. A massage candle is great. You light it, it smells nice. You can pour it on your partner's body and it turns into massage oil. It'll be warm but not hot, it won't burn them. Do not do this with a regular candle. You will burn the shit out of your partner. It will kill the mood. Um, but with this, it turns into a lovely massage oil. So you can create an intimate, sexy, foreplay, good time. Um, and then there's lots of great books out um, by different sex authors. Allison Moon is here. She was on, I think she's on the, she was moderating the censorship panel, but she's a tremendous queer sex educator and author. Her book, Girl Sex 101, is part sex ed book, part comic book. It's really fun to read. It's got tons of great illustrations. It's trans inclusive. Um, it has a great section on if you're suffering from a disability or chronic pain. It's my favorite queer sex ed how-to book. And it's just fun to read. It's well written and the comics are great. That was what we had. You know, we have to talk position for a second. <laughs> Um, in my former life as a sports chiropractor, there were a lot of young gay women in sports and they would eventually get injured and wind up in my office. And too many times I would be working on their necks and it would feel like somebody had just squished their head down on their neck and these people were getting headaches, they had neck pain, and I may not have known they were gay until I actually felt their neck. <laughs> and you know, I'm their doctor and I have to approach this in a gentle way and I would have to say to them, um, we need to have a little chat about your sex life. And they would say, why? And I would say, well, you know, several weeks in a row you're coming in and you're telling me you have headaches and everything that I feel under here is just so compressed. It's from oral sex on women. <laughs> Normally, one person will be on their back, some will, will be going down on them, and this is what happens to the head. <laughs> Use pillows. There are wedges. There are companies making wedges and pillows. There are so many things to find positionally. Change the position change it. Even a slight change can make a world of difference on your muscles. Huge. Um, one of my favorite companies is called Liberator and they make different oh, right. Right, sex, right, right. sex furniture basically but it's foam wedges or circles or these foam kind of cushions that don't really squish down like a pillow. They hold their shape and it's great for just changing positions. Can be like it's great if you're suffering, if you're someone has, who has chronic pain or if you're just something about your positioning of sex is uncomfortable. Invest in a liberator wedge or one of those liberator pillows. It's better than not having sex and making yeah. excuses for it. And it's better than chronic pain. Totally. Um, so we're going to take a couple of questions from the bag. Um, let's see. Oh, and what's if you want to... What's in the bag? Um, if you want to follow us, um, our hashtag is Clexicliterati. Um, and we're on this, that's our social media handles, our websites. I also wrote and directed a sex positive queer web series called Thank You Come Again. Yay. Uh, we won best web series last year at the Clexicon Film Festival. And you can find us at TYCA Show. Or if you just type Thank You Come Again into YouTube, you'll find us. It's really fun. So some questions. Seriously, how does scissoring work? <laughs> Literally position that works. So scissoring is one of those things where it's like everyone talks about it. It's like the quickest thing when you're like lesbians, scissoring. So I'm not a scissoring expert, contrary to popular belief. Um, <laughs> but I've, I've found that I, can, I kind of can't do it with a straight face, no pun intended. I can't really do it seriously because it kind of makes me laugh. Um, so every time I've tried to scissor, it's always ended in giggles and like I kind of can't get there. Um, I would say if you want to try it, go for it. Try different positions. Try like one leg over the other. Try it on your side. Try it with one person on top of the other person. I would just try it a few different ways. And if it's something that some people love it, some people are really into it. If you find a position that works for you, great, go with it. If it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. And that's okay. You're not a bad lesbian if you can't scissor, if you don't like scissoring. We, we won't we revoke don't. your card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, why does it hurt but feel good when I have an intense orgasm? Ah, yeah, that's your sacral nerves. Um, 
if someone has a back problem, that can happen. Sometimes also the contraction of the vagina um, can be activating nerves. And if someone, let's say, has a tipped uterus or a, an oddly, sh you know, uh, positioned cervix, that intense, think of like a muscle spasm, can contract so intensely that it may feel really good when your brain is being flooded with all that dopamine, and then as the body starts to renormalize, you actually are feeling what was there a, a few seconds earlier. You just couldn't feel it because of the flood of chemistry in the brain. Solid. So here's one. How do we talk to a partner, or how do we start to talk about STDs? And how do we disclose or start the conversation if you have any biological issues, physical issues, chronic pain, ouchy points? Um, and again, this all goes back to communication. It's important to sit down. And this is a conversation to have not when you're naked under the sheets and it's already like the passion's flowing. This is a conversation to have on the way to the bedroom when you're talking together and just be like, you know what, before... Before we get into this, like I'm, you really turned me on. I'm really excited. I want to have sex with you, but I need to disclose X, Y, and Z. And there's no other way than just coming out with with it and talking about it. Your partner will not be mad. They will not be like, I can't believe you have chronic pain. If they are, they're an asshole. Totally. Um, and that's not someone you want to have sex with. But the most important thing is to be upfront. And a good partner will listen and be like, okay, I understand. Tell me, what do we need to do to accommodate this issue that you have? And if they don't, leave. Yeah, and if they don't, that's not someone you want to fuck. Uh, let's see. Uh, I struggle with achieving an orgasm, even when I'm masturbating. How can I work on this? It feels like it gets to be too much and I stop. So this is a pretty common problem. Actually, for a lot of people, if you haven't had an orgasm yet or you're trying to achieve an orgasm, it's very easy to kind of get in your head about it. And then the more you get in your head, and the more you're in your head, the less you're in your body. Um, so the more you put pressure on yourself, like, I have to squirt this time at orgasm, or I have to orgasm, like, guess what's not going to happen? An orgasm. It's like, don't think of the pink elephant. And then you're like, well, that's fucking all I can think about. Um, I would say to take your time. I would say to use lube. I would say to find something really arousing, whether it's an erotic novel, or steamy fanfic, or porn, or whatever it is that gets you in the mood. Some people are very visual. Mm-hmm. Some people are more auditory, and, and where that's important is if someone's very visual, mm -hmm. they may get very stimulated by watching, you know, a hot movie, a great sex scene. Other people might want, like, some candles on in the bedroom with some mm -hmm. great music. Find what sense is really stimulating for you, just something you love, and go there. And don't think of anything other than feeling good. And what feels good in that moment? There really is no pressure. Yeah, don't put the pressure on yourself. Another thing I would say is maybe if you're masturbating and the feeling becomes too intense or it's too focused on your clit, move away from it. Kind of make concentric circles going outside and kind of you know further expand and explore other parts of the vulva to kind of reduce the sensitivity and the intensity. And you have to think about the bladder also. Yes. Because the bladder is right behind Everything that gets stimulated. So for some women, um, they may want a little bit of a fuller bladder because it actually helps to create pressure. In others, that may be the overwhelming mm -hmm. factor and they need to void before they have sex. Also, if you're having any type of penetrative sex, I would say pee after sex is always a good call because it just kind of flushes everything out. Um, sorry, yes, hand. Mm -hmm. um, totally. Birth Absolutely. Control, a lot of people don't realize that birth control can make it hard to come. When I first started having sex, I just thought it wasn't good. And then I forgot my birth control at home and we used alternate means. I was like, oh my gosh, this is good for the first time. And then um, antidepressants. Yeah. So, totally. So you talked about alternate methods of mm -hmm. birth control. Like if you're on it for regulating your periods, there's other ways. Blood pressure them. medication. Yeah. There's a lot. So, yeah. And a lot of, they don't tell us, with, with antidepressants, they usually will tell you that. Mm -hmm. But with birth control, a lot of times they don't tell you that. Yeah, it's very, it's very prevalent with antidepressants. Um, I would find if your doctor is not 
making you feel comfortable talking about sex or is downplaying your libido, your sexual satisfaction, that's not a good doctor. I would find another doctor. Um, you can A great resource for queer friendly doctors is your local L- LGBT center or community center or group. Maybe um, even Planned Parenthood. Yeah. Yeah, to find a doctor that can actually talk to you about this stuff and address these issues in a positive way. And just remember, we're doctors, you know? That's our job. And so if anyone ever makes you feel uncomfortable in a professional atmosphere, walk out. Yeah. And because in a lot of, especially with female sexuality, doctors will want to downplay it or act like it's not important. It's important. Your sex life is important. Your sexual satisfaction is important. Everyone's entitled to sexual enjoyment and a healthy sex life and satisfaction. Um, We're sorry. We're unfortunately out of time. I'll be outside if anyone has any more questions. Um, And we're also going to give away some toys. Um, uh, Sarah, tech support. Uh, is going to come up and get a toy. And anyone, if you have a question that I didn't answer, form a line and and maybe you'll win something. I think they have three minutes till they need the room. Oh, do they need to need the room right now? I think so. Um, so when they want to do the giveaway. Right? Yeah, yeah. So so that that'll be it for us. Like I said, I'll be in the hallway. If you have any questions, I'll just be hanging out. If you see me any other time today or tomorrow, just be like, ah, the vaginal pH, and Same we'll talk here. about it. Same here. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for.